So how do we approach Aristotle's um, virtue ethics? Well, the first thing we've got to do is to work out what is a good life, right? And so to do that, we're going to use some examples that might not deal with actual life, but they get the idea across about what Aristotle was thinking about here. And so to get this idea across, he would use um, objects as an example. And he'd say, look, if you've got an object, an object will have a function. And that in order to carry out that function, it's going to need some excellences, some attributes. And there will be a way to classify those attributes to work out um, whether the object is carrying out the function, whether it's good. Okay, so that's what we're really dealing with here, the foundational elements. From there, we can work out, okay, well then, what's it like to have a good life? But, but let's go into this a little bit deeper. So Aristotle's really saying that everything has a goal or a function. And that if we're going to perform the goal or function well, you need some excellences. And excellences can also be thought about as attributes, if we put it that way, some attributes of the, of the thing. Okay. And what we're going to do in a minute is extend this idea from things to people. But let's take the example we hear is golf clubs. Let me do one live. We could, we could also look at, say, a knife. Okay. So the function of a golf club is to hit golf balls. The function of a knife is to cut. Okay. So in order to do this well, so if we're going to have a good golf club, let's go back to our golf club example. If we're going to have a good golf club, it'll have the right size, weight, balance, materials, and there'll be some attributes about the golf club. Have a think about a knife, right? A good knife that's going to cut well. Again, it's probably going to have a good balance. It's probably going to be sharp. It's probably going to be strong, right? So we have these, the attributes are not exactly the same between a golf club uh, and a knife. And so what's really important from Aristotle's perspective is to think about the function of the object that we're working with. And so now we start turning it into using it for ethics and humans, and we start thinking, well, what are the excellences, what are the attributes of a good student, of a good manager, of a good accountant? And we could put in anything here, but we're starting to be specific, a bit like golf club or knife, only we're thinking about a, a role in society. Now, while we can apply this concept to uh, specific roles in society, and that's very useful if we want to um, take a virtue ethics approach, we can also apply it generally, right? Because Aristotle thought that humans, like other things part of our natural world, have this function. And he decided that our function was to flourish. Now, he did this by eliminating some other things. So the first thing he eliminates are hedonistic pursuits, right? Because he's saying, well, really, we, we, can, we have intellectual ability, we can reason. So he's a bit like Kant in that, right? And he's saying we can reason, therefore, just purely pursuing these hedonistic pleasures in an animal-like fa fashion um, is not part of being truly human. That's more being an animal than being human. Okay, so that's the first thing he starts to do. Then he starts to look at some um, other things that you might pursue, like wealth, um, what's the other one we've got here? Wealth, honor, power is another example. And he says, look, really, we don't pursue wealth for wealth's sake. Well, maybe if you've got a, got a few problems psychologically, you do, but generally most people don't. They want wealth to do something else, right? They want wealth to be able to enjoy themselves, to help their families, to make a difference in the world. So the pursuit of wealth and power and honor and those things is probably not the function, right? It's secondary to the ultimate. So it comes, what is this ultimate? And his view was that we will flourish, that, what, that, that, that our aim is to be flourishing humans. It's not quite the same, right, as being happy, etc. It has that welfare benefit element about it, but it might involve um, self-sacrifice, etc. In fact, he had a word for it, uh, eudaimonia. How do we spell that? I think it's E U D eudaimonia okay so he had this particular word for it which which was really about flourishing is probably the closest we can come to it and we flourish um, when we're uh, acting and behaving in accordance with the virtues 
So to summarize, humans have their own goal or functions, right? And then if we can identify the attributes of a good human, right, then what we will end up doing is flourishing. Okay. So what are the various alternatives that we could look at? We could look at pleasure, we could look at honor and wealth, but he rejects these, right? As we've said, he rejects uh, hedonistic pleasures um, because it doesn't take account of humans rationality. He also rejects honor, wealth, power, those kind of things, because really we do them to get something else. So they're not the ultimate goal. Instead, he believes that flourishing, or did believe, he believed that flourishing is best expressed as acting in accordance with virtues or excellences. And he separates them into two kinds of virtues. The first are the intellectual virtues uh, about reason. And again, he emphasizes strongly our rationality. Um, things like knowledge, um, craftsmanship, or the ability to build things and do things really well, wisdom, right? These are all intellectual virtues which we should try and develop. Then he also developed character-related or moral virtues. They're, of course, what we're most interested in. Courage, justice, self-mastery, generosity, a list of these particular virtues. In the next little video, we're going to delve a little bit deeper uh, into these virtues and also start to think about how Aristotle actually saw them being used. You know, how, do we, how do we determine what is a courageous thing to do, for instance? So for the next video.